This is the penultimate uh, presentation of Juan de Marcos. Uh, so don't come next week, the following week, but on December 8th, um, we'll be back here in this room. And this residency is co-sponsored by the, uh, the Arts Institute, the Office of Multicultural Arts Initiative, and of course the School of Music. We have co-sponsorship from the Department of Art History, the Dance Department, Art, LASIS, Haven Center, the Greater Madison Jazz Consortium, Dane County Cultural Affairs Commission, Hunter State, and the Overture Center for the Arts. So without further ado, Dr. Juan de Marcos Gonzalez. Well, thank you for coming tonight. You know, we are Cubans, so everybody identify us because uh, we are Negrito from Vero. This is what's normal. But uh, in our country, we do have uh, uh, a very important movement of uh, symphonic music. We have had symphonic music in our country since uh, the 18th century. People writing music in different styles. And uh, the first musician that was really important was Esteban Salas. Previously, I've talked uh, about uh, Esteban Salas, who was the first uh, composer that we really have news about. There was one more, Juan Paris, but uh, there's no music. We have been unable to find the music of Paris, but we do have the music of Esteban Salas and we're going to be talking about him today, tonight. Uh, you know, the Cuban music is huge, the popular Cuban music is very important, and that's why, uh, perhaps, this is one of the reasons why the symphonic Cuban music is not that well known in the world. But we have had, as I've said before, composers from the, let's say, a classical period, Baroque period, up to the Syrian music, 12 tone music, and all kind of the different styles of the symphonic music in, in our country. Uh, the first works uh, about, I mean, the first works uh, in the Baroque style were made by Esteban Salas, I have said before. Esteban Salas was a, a, a priest and he was uh, working at the uh, Cathedral of Santiago de Cuba for a long time. We are going to put a couple of examples of how the Cuban music has been treated by uh, really important composers. I have uh, examples of uh, uh, American composers. Adam Copeland wrote a danson based on Cuban music. Of course, if you listen to the danson of Copeland, it's very far away of the normal danson that we have performed in our country for years. Uh, Bernstein was uh, conducting for the, uh, a symphonic ensemble for Broadway, a cha-cha-cha, but indeed, uh, they are really far away. Even Gershon also wrote music based on, on Cuban music, especially in one song that became uh, pretty famous during the beginning of the century, a song, traditional song by Ignacio Pinheiro called Echale Salsita. We are going to listen to a normal cha-cha-cha, This is a cha-cha-cha that I recorded back in uh, 2001 for a great Cuban singer called Felix Baloy. And this is the birthday in cha-cha-cha. That's for what side, sorry. Oh, 
those pitch drums are much too low. It should be so elegant and <coughs> little high ones. And tambourine just touches. There's light there as possible, right? You better go back. It's take 74. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, this is a Bernstein uh, interpretation of what a cha-cha-cha is. It's written in a symphonic style. It's very far away of our normal cha-cha-cha. Uh, but anyway, uh, you can have a look to how the popular Cuban music influenced on, uh, uh, let's say, Western composers. Now we are going to play. This song is called Echale Salsita and was written by Ignacio Pinheiro during the 20s. It's one of the most important songs of the history of the Cuban music and perhaps the term salsa that we know and that's the name that we normally use to call the Latin American music made in New York City from the late 60s and 70s, it's coming from the title of the song, Echale Salsita. And now, listen to Gershon. As you can listen, he only used a couple of bars. He was very smart. Over two bars, you have to pay. And he was a great composer, but at the same time, he was uh, born here in America. So he knew that after two bars, he should pay the copyrights to the composer. Even when Pinedo was in Cuba, Well, Esteban Salas, I told you, that was uh, our first uh, serious composer. He started counterpoint, he studied violin in the parish church of Havana. At a certain point of his life, when he was uh, in his uh, 30s, he went to Santiago de Cuba, where he was appointed as uh, the master choir of the uh, Cathedral of Santiago de Cuba. He was a Baroque composer. He wrote a lot of music, basically messes. He wrote also uh, carols. In the carols, he normally followed the classical uh, Baroque style. Uh, Ternetti, uh, carols, A, B, A, C, A, B, C, A, sometimes, uh, with the alternance of coros and solos normally following the style of the uh, Spanish bolero and the Spanish carols. I know that you have written carols, but our carols are different. Normally we uh, write the carols in, uh, or oh, he wrote during his times, the carols in quatrains, using quatrains of uh, octosyllabic quatrains. Here in America it's different. Uh, you don't use this kind of structure for your poetry, which is different. Eight syllabus uh, is not very common 
in the uh, Anglo-Saxon culture. However, in the uh, Spanish culture, the quatrains, octosyllabic quatrains are very common, and even another kind of uh, poetry, like uh, decimas and uh, other kind of uh, poetry. In fact, he was a great composer, and one of the uh, characteristics of his writing was that he was very, very, very ancient. He used to write uh, in the style of the composers of the 17th century, and even when in Europe changed the style for writing the music, he kept writing in the old styles. For example, for writing uh, the uh, bass, he normally uh, wrote the bass for the organ using the old style. So it means that he put the first grade of scale and then the, the, the player should know which other notes to add to the chords in order to, to play through it. I mean, for example, if the chord was normal, let's say a C, you know, C, the normal triad should be C, E, G. Then if you write C, just the C for the uh, uh, organ player, he should know that he will play the, uh, the chord major C. And then for uh, inversions, if you write, for example, the root of the chord, and then you add a four, uh, it means that should be the second inversion of a chord. So it should be C, G, E. It's understandable. You got it? Okay, this is the way that he used to, to write the music in this uh, really old style. But anyway, he gave, you, gave us uh, a lot of works, some of them really important. I'm not going to play carol because I have already played uh, carols by uh, this guy. And uh, I'm going to play religious music. He wrote uh, a Salve Regina. I don't know if any of you uh, is Catholic. But Salve Regina is one of the greatest, uh, let's say, hymns, anthems, written for the uh, Lady Mary, who was the, the Man of Christ. So, this is the Salve Regina of Esteban Salas. Just I would like to add that one of the greatest Cuban contemporary composers, I'm talking about Jose Maria Vitier, he wrote a, a mass for Caridad de Cobre, which is the patroness of our country. It's a 
brown uh, version and the pattern is of our country and he wrote a Salva Regina with contemporary accent. It sounds like re religious music but at the same time it has all the chords and the, the treatment of the music in terms of the contemporary uh, one. Yes? Is there a special name for I don't know, they look like lutes, the plucked string instruments. Yeah, it, it's a kind of lute. It's a kind of ancient lute uh, of the old times, yes. And uh, there's a viola de gamba also that's playing one of the musicians. It's, uh, they were using the, uh, basically the instruments of the, the period, the, the Baroque period in, in Spain. This uh, chorus is uh, excellent. And the Salvadorina uh, wrote by this guy Stefan Salas is uh, outstanding. Well, even when we have the music of Stefan uh, Salas, thanks to Alejo Carpentier, who was one of the greatest uh, Cuban novelists and, uh, and special music musicologist, who went to Santiago de Cuba and was there for more than one year trying to find out the works of Salas, because we didn't have all until 1946, the music of Salas in, a, in our country. Nobody knew where the music was, but he was able to go there and discover the music of Salas, and that's why we do have his music, and his music is performed and even recorded uh, today. Well, even when we had Stefan Salas during the, uh, that century, I'm talking about the 18th century, he died in 1803, uh, it's in the 19th century when really uh, we uh, have, we had the most important uh, composers of the period. In fact, in Cuba, we never had properly a classical period. So we switch from the Baroque music straight to Romanticism, but using with certain classical elements in the music. And uh, during the period, during the uh, 19th century, we had the most important, some of the most important Cuban performers as well. And uh, it's very curious because uh, some of them were black. So we had Brindis de Salas, who was one of the most important violin players of his uh, period. He uh, was born in Havana. His daddy was one of the greatest musicians of the period. He was a, a band leader and a, a symphonic musician as well. But Brindis was a genius. And uh, we had Jose White, who was also a great Cuban composer and violin player. Jose Lico Jimenez was one of the first Cuban international piano players. Cecilia Rizzi, who was also a great uh, piano player. And some more musicians that really defined Cuba. Some of them wrote, uh, let's say, uh, bigger uh, works than the others, but uh, curiously, the, the most remembered mus uh, musicians of the period were those that wrote uh, more simple works. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about people like uh, Manuel Saumel, uh, Nicolás Ruiz Espadero, even when they wrote uh, music a little bit more complex, they are really remembered by uh, the music that they uh, wrote following the spirit of the nation is in the 19th century when we really define the country and we start creating symphonic style music but following the patterns that we uh, uh, inherited from the periods of the slavery in our country. We have to remember that the slavery in our country ended in 18, in, I mean in 19, uh, I mean 1886 and uh, the presence of the Africans in our country was uh, really important. During the 19th century, up to 1860-something, there were a lot of people coming still from Africa, and uh, perhaps that's why the African spirits being alive in our country uh, for so long. Well, one of the most important musicians of the period was definitely Jose White. Jose White was a violin player, thanks to his friendship with one American, important American musician who used to go to our country several times during the century. He went to parties 
where he studied at the Paris Conservatory. Uh, Jose Wyatt was an uh, unbelievable violin player, very famous uh, during the, the period, not only in Cuba, but also in, uh, in Europe. And he wrote music that reflects, in certain sense, the spirit of Europe and the European influence in the Cuban music. There are a couple of works of White that are really remarkable. One of them is a contradanza that we call La Bella Cubana, which is really beautiful. We won't play today uh, La Bella Cubana, but we're going to play the concerto for violin, concerto for violin of Esteban, uh, I mean, uh, Jose White. This is double string. There are uh, a couple of important things. First, he wrote the concert in minor F sharp, which is a difficult, really difficult key for the violin players. And he wrote it, I think, purposely to show the world that he was a great composer and a great performer. And there's one more thing. This music was lost for years. And it was uh, an American, uh, researcher and musician, Paul Glass, the guy that found the scores of this music in the Conservatory of Paris, in the library of the Conservatory of Paris. And then he and Kermit Moore, which is a great uh, North American uh, conductor and musician, they put together the score and then for the first time in this century, this uh, music was performed uh, by the New World Symphony Orchestra, uh, conducted precisely for, uh, by Ker Kermit Moore. So uh, in certain sense, you are linked, you Americans are linked to this uh, beautiful music. So let's keep listening to the second movement of this great work.
we cannot play the whole uh, concert, but uh, you can find the concert in YouTube and uh, even you can buy this uh, recording by the New World uh, Symphony Orchestra conducting, in this case, uh, Tyson, who is another great uh, North American uh, conductor. One of the greatest Cuban composers of the 19th century who wrote countless works, but is remembered especially by seven, for seven contradanzas that he wrote, was Nicolás Ruiz Padero. Nicolás Ruiz Padero was uh, strongly criticized in our country because he sounded a little bit in some of his works uh, European, but he wrote great uh, con the contradanzas and he is one of the most important Cuban composers of the century. There's something important in regards to Espadero. He was a really close friend of uh, Luis uh, Moro Gatschek, your uh, composer who was in Cuba for several times, several times, and even conducted orchestras in our country and performed music in our country. By the way, he was the first one who made a, a massive concert in our country, in Santiago, Cuba, using drums using drums and he brought the the drums of the Cucuye to the uh, symphonic hall in Santiago Cuba, Gatschek. Espadero was the one that wrote and prepared the posthumous uh, works of Luis uh, Moro Gatschek. They were really close friends, however they were very different people. Nicolás Luis Espadero was a very sad guy. He used to live inside of his house. Even he was uh, a kind of uh, trying to find a word. He was like, a, let's say, uh, a freak, definitely. He used to take alcohol baths uh, every night in order to avoid the, uh, uh, the diseases. And uh, unfortunately, once he took a bath of alcohol, he forget. Do you remember that in that during that period? Uh, they used candles and they, he wanted to light a candle and he died in fire. Mm -hmm. But anyway, he was one of the greatest Cuban composers. Uh, he wrote really remarkable works. His music is much more complicated than the music of some more composers of the period. He tried to be uh, more, let's say, universal when writing even Cuban music, but his contradances are unbelievably good. We are going to present tonight the music of Espadero, played by a Cuban-French musician, which is this lady that you can see there. I'm going to uh, tell you, have a look to the left hand of the lady. You know, the, 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 the rhythm of the contradanza could be either or or She's very good. She's a very good piano player, but she, she sounds a little bit uh, foreigner performing uh, this uh, work of Espadero. So, Lydia Salomon, Cuban French, performing the music of a bar. What was in the in the right hand was a triplet, and she played like a syncopa of uh, eighth note with two uh, sixteenth notes in the right hand a few bars ago.
I think that in this song you can listen to reminiscences of La Comparsa of Lepuana. Do you? Well, it's a, it, it was a great work and uh, really Espadero was one of the greatest composers of the period. One more great musician of the period was uh, Jose Manuel Lico Jimenez, who was uh, one of the first great Cuban piano players. He started basically uh, in Germany, in Leipzig, and in Hamburg, and also in Paris, where he and uh, he became one of the most important uh, performers of the period in Europe. At a certain point of his life, he got back to, to Cuba and he was trying to work in Cuba, but he was black and he had a lot of problems in order to, uh, to uh, keep his way of life in Cuba. So he got back to Europe and he died in Europe. Uh, when he was uh, in his 50s, he was appointed as one uh, of the uh, directors of the conservatory there in Hamburg, uh, where he died. He married a German lady who was living there his whole life. And uh, we have really little, little music of him, but this is one of his works, which is a fantasy, with the, let's say, the influence of the Romantic and the Classical period. Sounds a little bit like Liszt, yes or no? He was a German musician at the end. He was born in Cuba, but he was a German musician. He studied in Europe and he developed his career in Europe. So there is a strong influence of the romantic music of the 19th century in his works.
So he sounded very romantic. It's definitely uh, the work of an Euro European composer. But uh, we are really proud of him. He was uh, one of the first class performers in, uh, in Europe in the period. And he was able to, to put really high the name of our country in the whole continent. And right now, we are going to talk about perhaps the most important musician of the uh, 19th century. Not because he wrote a lot of works. Really, he was a very poor guy. And he, in order to make a living, he had to, to work a lot and write music for other people. Normally, he, he lived uh, preparing music and preparing scores for other composers. But this guy was the first one where, uh, that worked really the spirit of a Cuban music in our country. Many of the uh, different genres of a popular music that we have had during the uh, 20th century came straight from him. He was the first to play or to present or to advance the sound of the Guajira song, which is uh, in minor mode, the Guajira in the style, let's say, of Scarlatti, but with a Cuban flavor and using the Afro-Cuban patterns. He was the first one as well that really played something close to what we call them song. He wrote several contradances and he is remembered in our country uh, because of his contradances. Uh, many of them are really classical pieces of the Cuban repertoire and the most of the Cuban piano players perform the music of Saumel. There's a conservatory in Cuba, very important in the uh, downtown, in a neighborhood that we call Vedado, uh, with his name, Conservatory uh, Manuel Saumel. And he's remembered in Cuba really with love. He was the, one of the most important composers of the period. Right now, we're going to play the music of... Uh, sorry. Three of the contradances of Saumel. Now this sounds like a Guajira song, right? There's something important that I would like to mention. The structure of the contralanza is A, B, A, B, all the time. So A, A bars, section A is binary. A, then repeats A, then B, and then repeats B for a total of 32 uh, bars. In the case of Saumel, normally he wrote the first part, the first time that he plays the section A, 
it is normal section A. And then when he repeats the section A, it's the section A but with variations on the, on the, on the music of the section A. And he does the same thing with the section B. That's what you have heard right now in this kind of music that sounds a little bit like Guajira song that we developed during the 20th century. Great. The other great composer of the 19th century was Ignacio Cervantes. Ignacio Cervantes uh, was a student of uh, Luis Moro Gatschek and Nicolás Ruiz Espadero. And thanks to uh, Gatschek, he went to Paris as well. He studied there. He uh, won the first prize of composition and uh, performing as well in Paris and then he got back to Cuba and uh, started performing in our country. He wanted to make uh, bigger works but he is remembered by his uh, contradances. There's something important during the times of the first war independence in, uh, in Cuba which uh, started in 1868. He and Jose White were giving concerts and uh, collecting money in order to give to the uh, revolutionaries. And then, because of that, he was kicked off our country and he had to go to New York where he was living for years. When he left the country, he wrote perhaps the most important or one of the most beautiful contradances I have heard in my life, which is called Adios a Cuba, Goodbye to Cuba. And then, when he returned, after the period that he had to be outside, he wrote Juan more Contradanza, Regreso a Cuba. He is very uh, well known in our country, very respected, and he was a great, great, great musician. We are going to play the music of uh, Cervantes. In this case, it won't be a Contradanza, but a most uh, romantic work called La Serenata Cubana.
Well, this uh, we have been watching and listening to the music of the 19th century, the music influenced by Europe, but at the same time very Creole with the spirit of a nation, using sometimes the patterns that we do have and that define our culture. During the 20th century, uh, we had perhaps the most important, some of the most important composers of the, of the island. There are two especially, two special composers who began using the elements of the avant-garde music of the uh, 20th century and mixed this element of the avant-garde music, uh, European avant-garde music with the roots of the Cuban music using sometimes even uh, drums on stage. We are talking about uh, Alejandro Garcia Gatula and Amadeo Rodin. Also, we did have a uh, Grupo de Renovación Musical who was a, a group created by one Spanish uh, composer who came to our country and then he uh, created a group of composers and people interested to develop the spirit of the contemporary and avant-garde music in our country. Up to the contemporary composers of the uh, late uh, 20th century, uh, let's say from the 50s and up, up to uh, the contemporary composers of the revolutionary period in our, in our country. The most, in my opinion, the most important composer of the 20th century in our country was Amadeo Rodin. Amadeo was the first one that mixed the elements of the Afro-Cuban percussion with the spirit of the contem contemporary music coming from Europe, especially influenced by Stravinsky, but using uh, atonalism, but without coming to a more complex techniques such as the 12th ton or uh, serialist, serial, serial music. So he was the first that brought the tambores, the sound of the tambores, not precisely sometimes with the tambores, but with the spirits of the drums uh, and using the instruments of the symphonic orchestra. He was also the first one that wrote music specially for percussion before Edgar Varese here in America. He, he wrote music specially for percussion and we're going to listen to one of his works. This is La Suite, the suite of a ballet he wrote with uh, Alejo Capertier uh, during the first half of the 20th century. Listen to the music and listen to the drums. There are not drums playing. You are going to listen to the drums in the sound of the woodwinds and in the sound of the strings and in the way he used for orchestrating and composing the music.
unbelievable. Right? You can you can listen to the sound of the drums. He's playing six eight. Sounds Cuban, yes or no? Absolutely Cuban. And uh, he used certain rhythms and certain quotes of uh, Cuban congas. When he when he wrote pa 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 beep, oh, beep, beep, there's a conga from uh, Havana which says la conga de La Habana ya viene caminando la conga de La Habana ya viene Caminando, and he quote Cuban music and in, uh, in his works. Uh, he was a, a great composer. He also was a, an excellent violin player and an orchestral conductor. He was one of the conductors of the symphonic uh, philharmonic orchestra, the symphonic orchestra in, in Cuba, and also was the first violin of the uh, philharmonic orchestra in our country. Uh, and right now we are going to listen. These these pieces were written before Varese wrote the first works here in America using just percussion instruments. We are going to uh, uh, listen just a fragment because otherwise we don't have time to play everything today. This is the Iowa percussion ensemble. Thank you. 
now it's sounding like Iowa. The other great Cuban composer of the period was uh, Alejandro Garcia Catulla. I can say that uh, both this duet, Catulla and uh, Roldan, they defined the future of the Cuban music from the early uh, 20th century. Catulla also wrote music based on uh, Afro Cuban rhythms. There was one difference between they two. Catulla never had uh, studies of orchestral conduction so he was too aggressive and sometimes he wrote music for the instruments in the registers that the, the, that should be too difficult for the performer to uh, execute uh, this is the difference between Catulla and Rodin by they both were based on the Cuban music and were excellent composers one more thing about Catulla. Catulla was of the central part of the island, which was very racist during the uh, first half of the 20th century. But he got married twice with black ladies during that period. I'll tell you more. He once was uh, married to these two ladies at the same time. <laughs> Unbelievable. And uh, he also composed popular music. He created one of the first jazz bands in Remedios, there in the central part of the island. And he wrote danzones as well. He was uh, as good as a popular musician as a, a symphonic composer. Uh, we remember Catulla really with love. It's one of the glories of the Cuban music. This is the New World Symphony Orchestra in the Tres Danzas Cubanas of Alejandro Garcia Caturla. Check that, he's much more aggressive.
This is the music of Catulla, which is, uh, uh, you heard that he's a little bit freak if you compare with uh, uh, Rodin. Well, Rodin was much more, let's say, polite, right, in the music. Meanwhile, Catulla was explosive. And in this music, you cannot hear this, really the explosion of Catulla, but anyway, you can listen to the spirit of the Cuban music and that he was a different composer than Amadeo Rodin. Then, uh, from about 1934 came to our country, or, or before 1934 came to our country, one of the greatest uh, composers we have had in Cuba. He was uh, born in Spain, but he moved to Cuba. And then uh, he was trying to help Cuban musicians to bring the spirit of the contemporary European music to Cuba in the same way that Catulla and Rodin did before. So he created a group that was called Grupo de Renovación Musical, where they not only, uh, let's say, discuss and analyze the uh, scores of the great uh, European composers of the period, but they also uh, had a magazine, they prepared expositions of painters and they were really an important group in the history of the Cuban culture of the period. The creator of this group was the uh, composer Jose Ardebol. Jose Ardebol, he tried to bring to this group the spirit of the music of Stravinsky, but we are talking about the second period of Stravinsky with the neoclassical music, this kind of style and he was the teacher of many of the greatest Cuban composers of the uh, uh, older periods, I mean, after, uh, even uh, after the 50s, I'm talking about people like Harold Gramache, Edgardo Martin, he was the teacher also of Julian Orbon, who was a great composer who died here in this country and was working in this country for years. Uh, also, Aurelio de la Vega, who is perhaps the most important uh, Cuban composer uh, alive right now in this moment. At least he's the most played Cuban composer uh, in his style, which is a 12 tone dodecaphonic style and serial music and this kind of really uh, difficult uh, music. Ardebo was uh, a very important uh, composer and a very important person in the development of the symphonic Cuban music in our country. And here we are going to listen a, a sonata written by Ardeol, just for guitar. He tried to be Cuban in this song, but, uh, but normally he was very neoclassical, very European, and following much more, more Stravinsky and the music of Manuel de Falla than this kind of music that sounds like a Guajira. Thank you. 
Well, in this work, uh, a devil sounds much more like Villa Lobos, right? Sounds more like Villa Lobos and uh, sounds very Creole. But normally he wrote music in the uh, neoclassical style. And the only one, the only musician that really followed him in this kind of work uh, with the neoclassical music was this gentleman, Hilario Gonzalez. Hilario uh, went to Venezuela once with uh, Alejo Campetier just for uh, a concert and to prepare certain works in Venezuela, but he uh, kept living in Venezuela for years and then he got back to Cuba and he wrote music mixing elements of the uh, Afro-Cuban culture with the neoclassical uh, European uh, style. Uh, We're going to play one work of uh, Hilario, which are congas. So he wrote congas following the patterns of the neoclassical music and mixing these elements with the uh, uh, conga, cubana. The music is modal, but tonal, which is very important. One more Cuban, uh, great Cuban composer. He even uh, was the first one Cuban musician to uh, get the Sky Award, one award given by uh, his work of the whole life, writing music and teaching uh, in Cuba was Harold Granach. Harold uh, is not a neoclassical uh, composer. He was much more uh, within the uh, parameters of the serial music, but also he wrote music based on the Cuban spirit in the kind of movement that we call folklorism. He died uh, just a few uh, years ago, and this is a kid, he's only eight years old, performing the music of Harold. He's a savant, the kid. He's a, unbelievable.
you can listen that he's mixing a contradanza. It was a contradanza, the first uh, style that he played right now. He's playing um, uh, peace and music, musica campesina. It's like a guajira. One more great composer of the period was uh, Julian Bon. He uh, was born in Spain and he moved from Spain to Cuba when he was uh, young. His father was also a musician and was the founder of the Orbon Conservatory in our country, who was attached to the Grupo de Renovación Musical for a period. Then he left because he wasn't interested in this kind of treatment of the study of the uh, the influence of the neoclassicism in the uh, Cuban music. So he moved away. He left the country later. He was living first in, uh, in New York. He lived in Philadelphia also. He went to Spain as well because he tried to find out his roots, his Spanish roots. And then from there, uh, write the music. He uh, wrote several important pieces using a kind of treatment of the music that uh, reminds very much uh, what Manuel de Falla wrote during his period. He's very influenced by Falla and uh, perhaps one of the uh, special Cuban composers of the Grupo de Renovación Musical. This is a quartet written by Orbón. Sounds like fire, right?
Well, listen. Yeah, tiene sabor, eh? <laughs> uh, yes. Well, there are two composers of the period, and one of them I would like to introduce to one of the uh, composers. Because he's perhaps the only one of the Cuban composers that didn't follow uh, strictly, let's say, a folklorist way for writing the music. He wanted to write a kind of international and universal music following the patterns of uh, contemporary uh, techniques, such as the 12-ton music and the serialism. In his first works, he was uh, more atonal than uh, later. Later was really freak, using 12-ton music and really uh, complicated music. We are going to present you the second movement of Intrata, which is one of the works he wrote for the Symphonic Orchestra of Venezuela. And this is the music. Aurelio de la Vega. sound much more like Berg than like Schoenberg, definitely. It's a tonal music, but it's more Berg than Schoenberg.
So, ladies and gentlemen, today uh, we have been listening to Cuban symphonic music. So, you know that uh, besides we do have a very important popular music, we are not only Negrito Rumberos, and uh, we have had great composers that really wrote important music. Right now, uh, before leaving, I would like to play you my favorite composition of the, I mean, it's not properly, let's say, uh, symphonic music, but it is a kind of the mix of the symphonic and the popular music. It was written by a composer who used to be the teacher of my daughter there in Cuba at the uh, National Institute of Arts. And uh, he's also uh, an orchestral conductor and he's the head of one of the non-governmental uh, organizations in Cuba called the National Union of Writers and Artists. His name is Guido Lopez Gavilan. He's been here in this country several times conducting the orchestra and uh, several orchestras in different places in different cities. The last time he was in Chicago with the Symphony Orchestra of Chicago. He's not as good as an orchestral conductor as as a composer. He's a very good composer. As an orchestral conductor, nothing special. And this is my favorite song. Check the sound. Y si le toca dirigir eso, se muere. Dice Wobancó, Flying Rumba.
Well, this is the music of uh, Guido Lopez Avilán. Of course, he used much more than two bars of the music of Ignacio Pinheiro. He's basically variations of the music of Ignacio Pinheiro, the famous song Ave Maria Morena, the famous Guaguancó that Pinheiro wrote about the end of the 19th century in our country when he was performing with the group of the Clave y Guaguancó. It's an historic song, but the arrangement is unbelievable. And this uh, lady who was conducting this small ensemble, which is called Camerata Romeo, is Senaida Romeo, who is the grand granddaughter of uh, one uh, uh, great Cuban musician that I have talked to you about before. I'm talking about Antonio Maria Romeo, who was one of the creators of the first charangas in Cuba, and the first one who played a piano solo in a charanga ensemble. So, thank you very much, and uh, if you have any questions, all right, time to go. Thank you. <laughs>